Uh, so, uh, my real pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Alexander Klibanoff. He's a professor of chemistry at MIT. Uh, he's also in the Biotechnology Center, is that the way to say it? That is correct, at, at MIT. He received his master's degree in chemistry in 1971 and PhD in chemical entomolo entomology in 1974 from Moscow University in Russia. And when he came to this country in 1977, he studied as a postdoctoral associate in chemistry at the University of California, San Diego. And in 1979, he joined the faculty at MIT, where he's now a professor of chemistry and a member of the Biotechnology Process Engineering Center. He's got a lot of research interests. We're going to hear about a particular emphasis today. But this includes stability and stabilization of proteins and enzymes as catalysts in organic chemistry, mobilized enzymes in cells, and enzymes in extreme environments. He's published uh, more than uh, 200 scientific papers and has several patents. And he's a member of seven different uh, journal editorial boards. He's received many w awards, uh, just to uh, name a few, the Leo Brand Award, uh, the Marvin J. Johnson Award, Arthur C. Koch Scholar Award from the American Chemical Society, uh, as well as the International Enzyme Engineering Prize. And uh, in 1995, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, and he's also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, not many people are members of both. In this, country, so this is really great. We are pleased to have uh, Professor Klibanoff here. And he's going to give us a membrane sciences colloquium entitled Enzymatic Catalysis in Organic Media, Control of Enzyme Selectivity by the Salt. Thanks very much, Ron. Um, I certainly appreciate to, uh, the opportunity to be here today and to tell you a little bit about uh, our uh, recent research. And specifically, I'll talk about enzymes in organic solvents and uh, more specifically uh, on controlling enzyme selectivity uh, by the solvent. Now, essentially all the studies that have been done in the area of biochemistry have been done using uh, uh, aqueous solutions as a reaction medium. And I think it's fairly easy to imagine how much more we can learn about the way enzymes function, about their structure, activity, relationship, and so forth, if we were to introduce a new fundamental variable in our studies of enzymatic catalysis, namely the reaction medium. And when I'm talking about the reaction medium, I don't mean adding 5% of acetonitrile or 10% methanol. I mean replacing water with a non-aqueous, uh, with an organic solvent as, as a reaction medium. In addition to this uh, uh, general uh, 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 basic biochemical uh, motivation, there are a number of uh, biotechnological reasons why it would be often very advantageous to carry out uh, enzymatic reactions in organic solvents rather than in water. And some of these reasons are shown on this slide. Uh, now, most compounds of interest to organic chemists and the food technologists are insoluble in water. <coughs> water often participates in undesirable side reactions. Thermodynamic equilibrium of many processes are unfavorable in water. Uh, product recovery from aqueous solutions is often very difficult because of a high boiling point of water. And finally, stability of enzymes in organic solvents may be much greater than in water. If nothing else, one certainly will not have a problem of microbial contamination uh, uh, in, in organic solvents. There are some other reasons as well, but I think that even these five are compelling enough. And in fact, they've been recognized for a long time. And in response to this recognition, a number of attempts have been made to using enzymes in media other than dilute aqueous solutions. And this next slide shows what might be called the evolution <coughs> of approaches to non-aqueous enzymology. The first step, which uh, was taken uh, uh, a very long time ago, at the beginning of the century, was to simply add small quantities of what are miscible organic solvents, things like acetonitrile, perhaps acetone, to aqueous solutions of enzymes. The next uh, and more recent, more sophisticated step was to use enzymes in what's called uh, biphasic aqueous organic mixtures. Now, enzymes are soluble in water, are insoluble in most organic solvents. So basically, you take an enzyme, dissolve it in water, and then you emulsify this aqueous solution of the enzyme in, uh, um, uh, in, in a water-immiscible organic solvent, say ethyl acetate, maybe chloroform. Okay? 
So the enzymes, as I said, they're soluble in water, insoluble in organic solvents. They will remain in water. The substrates are added to the organic solvent. They will diffuse into the aqueous phase, will undergo the enzymatic conversion there, and the products will diffuse back. Now, systems like that are quite useful. They're not very efficient, though. To make them more efficient, it certainly uh, makes a great deal of sense to reduce the size of the aqueous droplets containing the enzymes. Uh, and uh, that's what's called microemulsions, which are efficient but not very stable. And in order to stabilize them, surfactants are frequently added to systems like that to result in what's called reverse micelles. The next step was to actually uh, place enzymes in monophasic, predominantly organic media, which would contain a small amount of water. For example, something like, say, acetonitrile containing 5, 10% of water, or maybe ethyl acetate saturated with water. And finally, the last, and I suppose the ultimate step, was to take a solid enzyme and place it in an anhydrous organic salt. Okay? Now, if you go over this paradigm depicted on the slide, I think you'll probably agree with me that it's not that surprising that enzymes remain catalytically active here, here, and here, because in all of these cases, enzymes are located in what is essentially an aqueous phase. It has some organic solvent in it, but it's predominantly aqueous phase, so one wouldn't really expect major uh, uh, changes uh, in enzyme behavior. On the other hand, uh, I think it is surprising that enzymes remain catalytically active in organic solvents containing little or no water. In fact, it's so surprising that I still remember when we published our first paper on enzymatic catalysis in anhydrous uh, organic solvents in science in 1984. Uh, there was a lot of skepticism at that time as to, first of all, whether it was true, but more importantly, uh, whether this would turn out to be a general phenomenon. Well, I mean, I can report today that uh, 12 years later, there's no question anymore that enzymes can work in organic solvents containing uh, um, uh, uh, little or no water, and because it's something that has been now reproduced and done in dozens of laboratories throughout the world, and in fact it has become a very active area of research. Today the main question is, what new things can enzymes do when they are placed in organic solvents compared to water? Okay? Now in my presentation this afternoon I will concentrate exclusively on this compartment here, namely enzymes in anhydrous organic solvents. And let me just say right off, that um, uh, if you just take an enzyme and throw it in the organic solvent, the chances are it will not be catalytically active. The relatively few things in science are quite that simple. In order to ensure uh, the enzymatic activity, one has to follow a certain set of rules that we've been able to elucidate. I will go over them very, uh, very quickly. They're not germane to uh, uh, the presentation uh, itself. The first rule deals with the nature of the solvent. And here, basically, the best solvents for enzymatic activity are very hydrophobic organic solvents, things like, say, toluene or uh, carbon tetrachloride. Because they are hydrophobic, they don't strip uh, those few water molecules from uh, the enzyme molecule that are really important for enzymatic activity. Enzymes actually do need some water, okay? It's a relatively small amount of water, uh, um, uh, what we refer to as essential water. And as long as that water remains on the enzyme molecule, they will be catalytically active. So hydrophobic solvents don't strip that water from enzyme molecules. Very hydrophilic solvents do, and that's why they're usually not as good. Although fortunately, um, uh, enzymes tend to hold on to that essential water so tightly that even in the most hydrophilic solvents, many enzymes retain a respectable enzymatic activity. In addition to that, even if this water has been stripped from the enzyme, it's possible to replenish it and thereby uh, recover the enzymatic activity simply by adding uh, a small amount, maybe a fraction of a percent uh, of water uh, to uh, the solvent, if it's necessary. In most cases, it is not. The third uh, requirement deals with the pH radiation. You all know that, of course, in aqueous solutions, enzymes require a certain pH, what's called pH optimum, in order to work in optimal fashion. The question is, what about organic solvents? If there's no pH in something like, say, hydrous octane. So the question is, well, how does the enzyme know what the pH is and whether the pH is right? We discover that enzymes have something that's referred to, that we refer to as a pH memory. In other words, they memorize the pH of the last aqueous solution they saw, the aqueous solution from which they are, say, lyophilized. At the molecular level, it means that the, uh, 
uh, ionogenic groups of enzymes acquire the ionization state that corresponds to the pH of that last aqueous solution, and then that pH uh, uh, state is retained both in the solid state and uh, in organic solvent. And finally, the fourth rule deals with elimination of diffusional limitations. Those of you who are chemical engineers know that uh, uh, if you have a heterogeneous catalyst, and as I mentioned earlier, enzymes are insoluble in most organic solvents, all organic solvents I'll be talking about today, you, go, you may encounter diffusional limitations. Now, there's nothing actually wrong with heterogeneous catalysts. In fact, more than 70% of all catalysts that are used in industry today are uh, uh, um, uh, heterogeneous catalysts. Uh, so in fact, it has a number of advantages. However, uh, as I said, uh, their uh, catalytic performance may be diminished by diffusional limitations. Chemical engineers have developed a number of ingenious ways of alleviating them. Uh, for example, in order to eliminate external limitations, you agitate the system vigorously. In order to eliminate internal diffusional limitations, you use sufficiently small particles. So we definitely do it in every single case. And as I mentioned earlier, if one follows these rules, then it appears today that many, if not uh, most enzymes, can work uh, in organic solvents. Not only can they work in organic solvents, but they actually exhibit some rather striking new properties when you place them in this very unnatural for them reaction medium. And an interesting thing here is that if you uh, take a look at what properties of enzymes protein engineers would like to change, so this is so-called protein engineers hit list. They would like to change using, say, site-directed mutagenesis, catalytic activity, substrate specificity, stereoselectivity, thermal stability, affinity, and so forth. It turns out that uh, organic solvents can do exactly the same thing. Organic solvents can alter in a very dramatic fashion, as you will see, all of these properties that, that protein engineering uh, uh, can change. So in a sense, you have here an alternative and complementary strategy to protein engineering, something that we refer to as solvent engineering, whereby you bring about changes in the catalytic behavior of an enzyme, not by changing the enzyme molecule uh, as, as such, but by changing the reaction medium in which it operates. Now, what I would like to do today, I will concentrate exclusively on uh, uh, changing enzyme specificity or enzyme selectivity uh, by the solvent, because this is something that is really uh, most uh, valued. Uh, it's a most valued feature uh, of enzymes. And to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, this is an example uh, of our uh, work where we discovered that substrate specificity of a model enzyme that I'll be talking about a lot today called Subtilisin Carlsberg. It's a protease from Bacillus lichenoformis. It's just a convenient uh, model enzyme to work with. And in this case, we discovered that substrate specificity of this enzyme is markedly dependent on the solvent. So let me take you through this. Now, uh, we had uh, two different substrates here. Uh, it's basically it's N-acetyl amino acid ethyl ester, which reacts with propanol to give a propyl ester and ethanol. It's a simple transesterification reaction. And as an R group uh, uh, here, we used either a very hydrophobic group, uh, um, a benzyl group shown here, so this will be phenylalanine, or we used a hydrophilic group, a hydroxymethylene group, so this would be serine, okay? And uh, uh, the definition of substrate specificity is the ratio of k cat over km, which is the measure of enzymatic activity for one substrate, say serine, to k cat over km for another substrate, say phenylalanine. So what we did, we used this enzyme to measure substrate selectivity in a number of anhydrous solvents depicted in this table. And when you take a look at the data, you see something rather striking. You see that uh, in the solvents at the top of the table, dichloromethane, chloroform, toluene, benzene, you can see that this ratio is much greater than one, meaning that in these solvents, serine is a much better uh, substrate than phenylalanine. Now, if you go to the bottom of the table, say tertiary butyl alcohol, tertiary butyl amine, you can see that here this ratio is actually much less than one, meaning that in these solvents, Phenylalanine is a much better substrate than serum. But just think about it. We use the same enzyme, same temperature, same concentration, same everything. The only thing we change is the solvent. 
And as you can see here, we, this caused a market change, in fact, an inversion of a substrate specificity of an enzyme. Now, we uh, found similar things uh, with uh, a number of other enzymes, so it certainly appears to be a general phenomenon. And the basic question that one asks when one sees the data like that is, well, why? Why does it happen? Why does the substrate specificity change? And if you just look at it superficially, the first and most reasonable explanation seems to be, well, it happens because surely the conformation of the enzyme changes when you go from one sol from water to an organic solvent and one solvent to another. And as the conformation changes, certainly it wouldn't be surprising to observe that the specificity changes. Now, we decided to address this question head on, and in order to do that, we solved what at that time was the first ever crystal structure of an enzyme in uh, an anhydrous solvent. And that was the structure, uh, uh, the structure of uh, subtilicin. So this is subtilicin, the same enzyme I just talked about, uh, crystalline subtilicin uh, uh, in anhydrous acetonitrile. So here, uh, the yellow pattern, this is the enzyme itself. These orange dots are bound water molecules. This is anhydrous acetonitrile, so you can see that this water is retained by the enzyme. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and these green dashes are bound acetonitrile solvent uh, molecule. Okay? Now, there are several things that I wanted to mention about this structure. First of all, apart from the fact that it's, it's a very attractive structure, the, imp the more important issue is that this structure turned out to be essentially indistinguishable from that in water. In other words, uh, moving the enzyme from water to anhydrous acetonitrile did not bring about significant changes in the conformation of the enzyme, which was really a striking thing to us. Now, we've just solved the structure of subtilicin in yet another unrelated anhydrous solvent dioxane. The paper should appear in PNAS. Uh, in, uh, uh, within the next few weeks, and we found the same thing. So not only does the structure not change when you go from one solvent to another, uh, from water to an organic solvent, it also doesn't change when you go from one solvent to another. Uh, Greg Farber from Penn State solved the structure of another enzyme, uh, chymotrypsin in uh, uh, hexane, and again found that the structure is very similar to that in water. So we can discount a change in the structure of the enzyme as a cause uh, of a change in, in antiacetic Well, then, then what? Well, if you think about it, there's one factor that must, absolutely must, uh, have an effect uh, on uh, enzyme selectivity. And this factor is called desolvation. Now, enzymes do what they do so well because they know how to utilize the free energy of binding of the substrate to the active center of the enzyme. Now, that free energy uh, of binding that's utilized in catalysis is actually the difference between the free energy of binding of the substrate to the active center of the enzyme and the free energy of binding of the substrate to the solvent. In other words, you have to take the substrate out of the solvent, and that costs you. You have to pay for desolvation. That's an energy unfavorable process. So that is your loss right there. Delta G as solvent, okay? And then you put it in the active center of the enzyme and you recoup this free energy lost, and then some, and that is your gain, delta G S enzyme. And that means that the uh, net uh, uh, energy, net binding energy that's actually being utilized in catalysis is the difference between the Gibbs free energy of binding of the substrate to the enzyme and the Gibbs free energy of binding of the substrate to the solvent. Okay? Now, and if you take a look at this very simple uh, equation, it tells you something that's actually quite profound. It tells you that there are two independent ways of altering the substrate specificity of enzymes, okay, and other types of specificity of a substrate in this particular case. The first one is to alter this term, which is what protein engineers do when they say redesign enzymes by means of uh, site-directed mutagenesis. The second one is to alter this term, which is what we do in what I, I um, uh, uh, called earlier solvent engineering. So this is really the basic thrust uh, of uh, 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 conceptually of what we're trying to do. Now what I would like to do for the rest of my presentation is to concentrate on a particular type of enzyme selectivity, 
that is very highly valued by chemical engineers, organic chemists, and others. And this is stereoselectivity of enzymes. That's why people really want to use enzymes in industry. Not because they're so active, there are other catalysts that are equally active. Not because of all these other nice things, because they are selective. Okay? So I will be talking about stereoselectivity and two types of stereoselectivity, prochiral selectivity and then at the end in anti-selectivity. So again, we discovered that uh, a prochiral selectivity of an enzyme is also a strong function of a solvent. Here we're using um, uh, crystalline uh, as well as in the rest of the work, we're using crystalline enzymes here, chymotrypsin, for which we know uh, the structure does not change. Uh, as a function of the solvent. So whatever the cause uh, of the effects that we observe is, it's not the structural change. Now, we're studying here prochiral selectivity. This is our prochiral molecule. You can see that this is a two-substituted 1,3-propane diol, okay? So in this particular case, it's 2 dimethoxy benzyl 1,3-propane uh, diol. You can see that this carbon is prochiral because uh, it has two identical substituents, but if we isolate only one of these hydroxyl groups, then the substituents will no longer be identical and therefore it will become chiral. Now we actually, and that's exactly what we do, we use gamma chymotrypsin to mono-isolate uh, 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 the hydroxyl, one of these hydroxyl groups, okay? Now there are two routes of mono-isolation. You can isolate this one, then you end up with the S monoester, or you can isolate this hydroxyl group then you end up with the R mono, uh, uh, mono ester. And we actually use chiral HPLC. We can follow, make sure that it's mono isolation. And we can see if you pre-calibrate the column, which we did, whether it's the RS product or the R product. Now, by definition, the prochiral selectivity is defined uh, as K catovacium uh, in the pro S root to K catovacium in the pro R root. And we did it in a bunch of uh, uh, organic solvents, and the data are shown here. Once again, C in diisopropyl ether, dibutyl ether, cyclohexane, the ratio is much less than one, meaning that the pro R root, that is this root, is preferred. Whereas if you go to methyl acetate, you can see, or acetonitrile, you can see that the pro S root is preferred by a factor of approximately two. Okay? The question is, can we quantitatively count? So basically what we have here is a 22-fold uh, uh, change in prochiral selectivity. Can we quantitatively account uh, for that? And in order to do that, we developed a thermodynamic model, uh, which is actually not as complex uh, as it seems. I'll take you through it. It's actually fairly straightforward. And uh, the model uh, is as follows. We have uh, um, the enzyme and the substrate in solvent A. So A and B refers to the solvent. In solvent A, they react with each other. They form a transition state in the solvent A. Then this transition state proceeds along the reaction coordinate and eventually will regenerate the enzyme and will give you the product. There is another hypothetical way of getting from here to here. And this would be for the enzyme and the substrate to separately partition from solvent A into another solvent, solvent B, to react with each other in solvent B to give the transition state in the solvent, and then uh, for this transition state to partition from, the solvent, uh, from this solvent, from solvent B into solvent A. I'm not saying that it actually happens, but it certainly is another way of getting from here to here. And the thermodynamic theory, of course, tells us that it doesn't matter how you get from A to B, whether you go through C or through D. We're going to use that. Now, for thermodynamic reasons, which will become clear in a moment, okay, in describing this partitioning and this, uh, these reactions, I would like to break up the substrate molecule into two parts, hypothetically, break it up into two parts. The first part is what we call S sub U, this is the part that will be desolvated or unsolvated in the transition state with the enzyme. And the second part, S sub S, is the, is the part of the substrate that will remain solvated. Okay? I mean, I can break it up any way I want to. It's a hypothetical thing. Uh, so that is how I chose uh, to do it, and you will see in a second why. Okay? Now, so uh, once again, so this is the part that will be desolvated in transition state. This is the part of the substrate that will remain solvated in the transition state. 
Now, uh, therefore, I can describe this partitioning as delta G S sub U plus delta G S sub S plus delta G E, right? Because the enzyme is partitioned where delta G is the energy of transfer. Now, uh, this partitioning here would be delta G uh, E S uh, uh, transition state U, okay? So this will be this part, the enzyme plus the desolvated portion of the substrate plus delta G for the solvated portion of the substrate. And of course we have delta G, G, uh, delta G dagger act, uh, uh, in solvent A and delta G dagger in solvent B. Now if I use that thermodynamic theory that I just mentioned to you uh, a moment ago, I can write that uh, that uh, delta G dagger A equals delta G dagger B plus all this other stuff there uh, with uh, the corresponding signs. In other words, basically what I'm saying is that delta G dagger A equals this plus this plus this plus this plus this plus this. Okay, so basically that's all I did. That's what I wrote down here. Now, at this point, I can make a very important uh, simplification. And the simplification is that since the enzyme is so big and the substrate is so small, the, oops, uh, and the substrate is so small, then the uh, transfer of the free enzyme and of the enzyme plus the desolvated portion of the substrate will have the same uh, free energy. That means that this term and this term will cancel out. Now, of course, this term and this term will cancel out no matter what, okay? Now, if you go through simple algebra, you're going to arrive at this equation that basically tells you that K cat over K, I'm in solvent A, equals K cat over K, I'm in solvent B, times the ratio of these thermodynamic activity coefficients. We uh, expressed delta G's transfer via thermodynamic activity coefficients where this is a thermodynamic activity coefficient of the desolvated portion of the substrate in solvent A, and this is a, a, a thermodynamic activity coefficient of the desolvated portion of the substrate in the transition state in solvent B. Now, it's kind of a mouthful to repeat it every time, so I won't, but let me just say that the reason that it says a, a, a gamma prime here is because this is desolvation portion of the substrate, or solvent inaccessible portion of the substrate, in the transition state, okay? That's what we're referring to. That's why I broke down the substrate the way I did, and you will see the merit of it, okay? So we have this equation. Now, this equation is true for any substrate. So if you write this equation for two substrates and you divide one by the other, you will get the equation for substrate specificity. Now, in the case of prochiral selectivity that we're dealing with, there's actually no two substrates. There is one substrate. But that substrate uh, can undergo two reactions, the pro-S reaction, which gives the S monoester, and the pro-R reaction that gives the R monoester. So, of course, we can write this uh, equation for pro-S and pro-R. And that's what I did here. And then we can divide this by this, do a simple rearrangement, and what we're going to get is this equation. Logarithm of K cat over Km pro S to K cat over Km pro R. So this is um, the logarithm of prochiral selectivity equals the logarithm of the ratio of the thermodynamic activity coefficients of the desolvated portion of the substrate in the transition state in solvent A plus a logarithm of a complex term all of the uh, uh, parameters here refer to solvent B. And now we can do something clever. We can say, if we promise that we will never ever change solvent B, so solvent B is going to become a reference solvent, <coughs> we will never change it, then it doesn't matter what this is, because this is going to be a constant. And then we'll simply arrive at the equation that the logarithm of prochiral selectivity should be equal to the logarithm in any solvent should be equal to the logarithm of the ratio of thermodynamic activity coefficients of the substrates in the transition state plus a certain constant, okay? So now we have the equation. All we need to do is to verify this equation to see whether it's actually true. Now, this term is no problem for us because we know this term. In fact, what I had here earlier, k cat over km pro s to pro r, that's what we need. So we just take the logarithm of that and we already have it in a bunch of solvents, right? So we're all set with this term. That's we already have. 
So what we really need now is we need to somehow determine this. And that turns out to be a fairly difficult undertaking. Nevertheless, we managed to do it. So we developed a strategy for calculating, not measuring it experimentally, uh, but calculating the gamma prime values. And our strategy consists of two parts. In the first part, we use structure-based computer modeling to determine the conformation of the substrate in the transition state, and then it calculate its unsolvated portion. You will see how we do that, okay? Now, let me show you uh, uh, what the uh, uh, rationale for this computer modeling approach here is. Again, it sounds complicated, but if conceptually you understand that that's all you, uh, all you need here, okay? Now, first you construct the tetrahedral intermediate. So we model the transition state by an appropriate, uh, by corresponding tetrahedral intermediate. So a tetrahedral intermediate is a model of the transition state for the enzymatic uh, deisolation, okay? Then we do uh, use energy minimization to refine the structure of the tetrahedral intermediate. And the way we do it is we repeat, actually repeat 40 times, sets of the following. We simulate heating the tetrahedral intermediate to 1500 uh, 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 degrees Kelvin, okay? Meaning that we give it a tremendous amount of energy so that it, can, it has the ability to assume whatever conformation it wants. Then we freeze the resultant structure. So it has assumed whatever conformation it wanted, and we freeze it. Then we use energy minimization to optimize the structure, and then we save it, okay? And then we do it 40 times, 39 more times. Again, we give it a 1500 degree jolt, and it will accept whatever conformation it wants, and then we freeze it, we energy minimize it, and then we save it. And then out of the 40 optimized structure generated, we select the one that has the minimal energy and say, this is it. And we're using it, doing it 40 times as opposed to two because we want to make sure we have a large number and as opposed to a thousand because thousand is a real pain even this thing takes two weeks. Okay, so we feel that 40 is a large enough number um, and, and, and other folks actually in the literature in other situations do similar types of things. Now then, uh, once we have this structure of the minimal energy, we determine the solvent accessible surface area of the substrate in this tetrahedral intermediate. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this describes uh, how we do it. So this is a general theory. Now I want to show you what we actually get as a result of that, okay? So this is uh, the computer-generated structure. Let me see if I can focus it. This is a computer-generated structure of the Pro-S tetrahedral intermediate for the deacylation of the acyl uh, gamma chymotrypsin with this uh, uh, prochiral, uh, uh, prochiral diode, okay? So this band here, okay, this band, uh, this is the enzyme and this green, white, and, and the red thing, uh, that is the substrate, okay? Now the important thing here is that you can see this is uh, the dimethoxy benzyl group. This is this group. You can see this is a benzyl ring, this is oxygen, this is methyl. This is another oxygen, another methyl. And you can see that what happens is that in the Pro-S configuration, this dimethoxy benzyl group actually doesn't fit into the binding site, into the S1 site of the enzyme, so it sticks out. It's exposed to the solvent. It is not desolvated in the transition state. That's what the data show. Now, this is Pro-S. This is Pro-R. And you can see that in the Pro-R, that is different. In the Pro-R, this is the dimethoxy uh, benzyl group, and you can see that it is enveloped by the active center of the enzyme. In other words, it is dissolvated in the um, uh, transition state in the pro-R, but not the pro-S uh, uh, configuration. Now here we use the Connolly algorithm to actually determine uh, the surface accessible areas. These dots correspond to surface accessible areas. So if you have dots, it means that the surface is accessible to the solvent. If you don't have dots, it means that north in the transition state. So you can see that in the case of a Pro-R, that uh, dimethyl, this is the, the last structure, the uh, dimethoxy benzyl group, there are no dots here. What does that mean? It means that it is fully desolvated in the transition state. Only a little bit of a fragment on this side is solvated. On the other hand, for the Pro-S, just as we kind of saw there, uh, you can see that you have dots all over here, meaning that it is actually almost fully uh, solvated in the transition state. In other words, it's not removed from the substrate. 
we can actually quantify uh, these uh, visual perceptions, and that's what we did here. So we calculated uh, extent of dissolvation of substrate groups. So this is percentage of dissolvation pro S, pro R. You can see this is for uh, methoxy 1, phenyl methoxy 2. You can see that for the pro R, just as we saw on the, uh, on the graph, uh, the percent of dissolvation in the transition state is essentially 100%. That was fully dissolvated. On the other hand, for methoxyphenyl and uh, uh, the second methoxy, the percent of dissolvation is, in all cases, less than uh, uh, 50%. Now we're done with the first part. So we optimized this and we calculated uh, the fraction that is uh, uh, dissolvated. Now we go to the second step. We use UNIFAC, those of you who are chemical engineers should be familiar with that. Uh, uh, use UNIFAC to calculate the thermodynamic activity coefficients, that is a gamma prime value, for the unsolvated portion of the substrate molecule in the transition state. So that's the second part, okay? How do we do that? Well, first of all, let me tell you what UNIFAC is. Now, UNIFAC is a semi-empirical uh, computer algorithm for calculation of the thermodynamic activity coefficient, okay? Uh, and it's a group contribution method which utilizes Van der Waals uh, volumes and radii of the component <laughs> molecules and some empirically determined intergroup interaction parameters. To put it simply, chemical engineers figured out long time ago, long before chemists began to, that it's much more fun to sit at the computer and do a calculation, go to the lab and do the measurements, you know, with all the hustles involved and so forth. Okay, so they figured out how to calculate uh, thermodynamic activity coefficients without doing any experiments. And actually doing very well uh, with that in most cases. Not all cases, but in most cases. So that's what we decided to do too. Uh, so what we do, we approximated the unsolvated, the dissolvated portion of the substrate, our substrate in the transition state with distinct molecules. So this is that for the pro-S. This is that for the pro R, and then we calculated gamma prime values uh, in all the same solvents that we used for prochiral selectivity. So this is gamma prime pro S, gamma prime pro R, and this is the ratio of this thermodynamic activity coefficient. Now I want to remind you why we're doing that. We're doing it because we want to test this equation. The equation that says it should be a linear dependence between the logarithm of prochiral selectivity and the logarithm of the ratio of thermodynamic activity coefficients. That we determined in the very beginning. That we just calculated. I just show you how we do it. So this is what is referred to as a moment of truth. Okay. So now we want to test it. Of course, you know by now I wouldn't have told you all that if I uh, didn't have a successful result, and indeed I do. Um, uh, so this is the ratio of the prochiral selectivity as a function of uh, the ratio of the calculated um, uh, calculated thermodynamic activity coefficients in double logarithmic coordinates. So once again, these are the experimental points. Uh, um, uh, and uh, so th this determined experimentally, this is calculated. And indeed, as the theory predicted, we have a linear dependence here, and you can see that the fit is reasonable. In fact, I was amazed at how good the fit is given the number of assumptions and uh, the approximations and so forth. So, I mean, I, as I, to me, it's just an amazing thing that we indeed have the ability to not just explain, but it's actually quantitatively, almost quantitatively predict the uh, solvent dependence of prochiral selectivity simply on the basis of these types of structure-based uh, calculations. Now, this analysis, of course, is independent of uh, the enzyme. So we actually did the same thing with the other enzyme, subtilacin, that I talked about uh, a little earlier. Now, subtilacin has a much more shallow active center than chymotrypsin does. So we did all the same calculations, and that's what we got for subtilacin. Now, you, you remember that in case of chymotrypsin, pro R, we had 100% dissolution, pro S less than 50%. Here, you can see that for both of them, we have essentially the same degrees of dissolution, and they're not great. 9, 14, 55, 52, 54, 60, very similar. What does that tell us? According to our equation, it tells us that we cannot expect any significant solvent dependence of an antioselectivity because there is no significant uh, solvent, uh, uh, there is no significant difference in pro S and pro R uh, dissolvations. And indeed, when we experimentally measured uh, the prochiral selectivity for this enzyme, for subtilacin, you can see that, uh, first of all, prochiral selectivity is low, and second of all, there is no significant dependence. It's less than a two-fold dependence as a function of the solvent. We took some extreme solvents there, okay? So that's pretty good. I mean, you made a prediction and you verified it, it feels good. Okay, now we made another prediction. And the prediction we made is that 
basically this analysis shouldn't be limited to the particular substrate that we worked with. So what we did, we took that substrate, which was a dimethoxy thing, and we cut off the uh, uh, methoxy group. So now we have two benzyl 13 propane diol. And we made two predictions when, once we've uh, made the calculations. First of all, the calculations told us that with this substrate, the magnitude of the effect should be much less. It was 22-fold with the dimethoxy substrate. Here it told us it should be 3-4-fold. Uh, and indeed, we found that it is something like 3-fold. Okay? In addition to that, and that's really neat because this is something you would have never been able to predict, the calculations worked out in such a way that uh, uh, two substrates, uh, two, I'm sorry, two solvents, dioxane and diisopropyl ether, would change in their order compared to what we had with chymotrypsin. And indeed, we found the diisopropyl ether was here, dioxane was here. Here it's the other way around. So again, it turned out to be the same thing. So I mean, that actually looked quite promising. This is prochiral selectivity. We wanted to make sure that it's not limited to prochiral selectivity, so we did the same type of an analysis for another very important type of stereoselectivity, <laughs> namely enantio selectivity. That is the ability of an enzyme to separate between two enantiomers of a substrate. So these are uh, the experimental data that we obtained. So this is in anti-selectivity of crosslink uh, of uh, gamma chymotrypsin crystals. So again, work with crystals. So the question of change in conformation will not come up. And here we study a, uh, um, uh, a prop analysis of uh, uh, a methyl ester of uh, tropic acid, which is actually a basis for uh, some pharmaceutically active compounds. So this is actually a pharmaceutically important compound. Now, obviously, this is a chiral uh, carbon here. Uh, and uh, in a bunch of uh, uh, organic solvents shown on the left here, we measure an antioselectivity, which is defined as K-catova-KM S to K-catova-KM R. Okay? And again, you can see a marked solvent dependence of an antioselectivity. In fact, an inversion. 13, the S enantiomer is 13 times more reactive than the R enantiomer in cyclohexane. In acetone, uh, the R enantiomer is about twice as reactive as uh, the S enantiomer. If you were actually to carry out um, the resolution, this at uh, a 5% conversion, this will give you 85% uh, in antimeric excess for the S enantiomer. This will give you 21% in antimeric excess for the R enantiomer. So again, a dramatic dependence of an antioselectivity on the solvent with all the other things being the same. The enzyme concentration, everything, the temperature, everything else uh, is the same. So we decided to see if we can describe that using the same type of a uh, uh, type of an analysis that I've uh, uh, outlined to you, where we basically assume that the major, the dominant factor in the solvent dependence of enzyme selectivity is the solvent dependence of substrate dissolvation. Now, uh, this is the equation as applied to this case. So this is um, uh, in antiselectivity, the ratio of uh, uh, in, sol in uh, a given solvent. This is a ratio of thermodynamic activity coefficients in the same solvent. And this is a constant as long as we never change B. Now, we've done, again, uh, a structure. Uh, we've done uh, the uh, molecular modeling. And uh, what I would show you, uh, what I would emphasize here in the case of molecular modeling, let me see if I can focus it a little. Um, uh, again, so this is the uh, tetrahedral intermediate for the acylation of the uh, S in enantiomer of the substrate. And you can see that, for example, uh, this, uh, um, uh, benzo this phenyl group uh, um, uh, is, uh, is in this position. Let me just let you uh, compare it with this situation. So uh, here you can see that the uh, phenyl group, again, uh, doesn't fit into the active center of the enzyme. Uh, it uh, sticks out. Okay. On the other hand, if you go to the uh, R enantiomer, you can see that there, this is the phenyl group. So it's clearly enveloped by the enzyme. Uh, so uh, clearly the uh, uh, degree of dissolution will be very different. Uh, likewise, we calculated um, the, uh, the uh, surface accessible area for the S enantiomer and the R enantiomer uh, in the transition state. And uh, that's what's depicted here. We've done the calculations. Uh, and then used uh, Unifact to calculate gamma prime S and gamma, gamma prime R 
and their ratio. And then again, so we have the experimentally determined solvent dependence of enantial selectivity. We have the calculated ratio of thermodynamic activity coefficients in different solvents. And now we compare the two. And uh, this is what we got. Let me first bring your attention to the left figure here. So this is exactly the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the dependence of enantial selectivity on the ratio of thermodynamic activity coefficient in double logarithmic coordinates. And you can see that actually it looks uh, decent. In fact, the correlation coefficient here is 0.87. Now I have to say that I myself, when I see folks plotting things in double logarithmic coordinates, I sometimes get a feeling that there's something fishy about it. Because when people plot things in double logarithmic coordinates, it looks like they are trying to hide something. Because in double logarithmic coordinates, uh, everything looks better usually than in real life. Now, I have to say that that is not why we did it here. The only reason we did it here is because there is a fairly wide range of changes in enantial selectivity. And we want to make sure that all of the points have an equal weight. Um, but in order to make sure that it's not the double, lo double logarithmic business, we actually plotted the same data in linear coordinates, okay? You can see that the uh, negative is that the lower values, as they always are in linear coordinates, a bunch up here uh, close to zero. But the important thing is that we still have an excellent agreement between the experimental data and what is predicted. The slope here is one, just as the theory demands. And in fact, here, uh, the um, uh, correlation coefficient is even better than here, 0.93, okay? So let me uh, uh, conclude, and the final slide actually shows uh, some of the things that we've learned uh, from this work. First of all, I think that the work that I presented to you show unequivocally that the uh, uh, selectivity of enzymes, whether it's substrate selectivity or prochiral selectivity or enantial selectivity, is indeed strongly controlled by the solvent. So if you don't like, uh, say, an anti-selectivity or prochiral selectivity, screening enzymes is not the only way to find something better. There's another way, and that would be uh, screening organic solvents, or better yet, uh, 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 rationally selecting organic solvents. In addition to that, um, um, we found uh, that the solvent dependence of enzymatic selectivity arises from the differential free energy of dissolvation of the transition states. That is, we made an assumption in the beginning that this is the predominant factor. On the basis of this assumption, we developed a theory, we made predictions, we verified these predictions which suggests to us that the assumption made in the beginning was probably a correct assumption. Therefore, whatever other changes may occur when you go from one solvent to another are uh, 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 much less in magnitude than this. This is the predominant factor controlling solvent dependence of enzyme selectivity. Uh, um, the next, uh, in cases of stereoselectivity, this difference in dissolvation energy is solely a consequence of alternate portions of the substrate being shielded from the solvent in each transition state, okay? So we understand exactly where it comes from. And finally, we found that molecular models of the transition states combined with activity coefficients can be used to predict almost quantitatively the solvent dependence of enzymatic uh, selectivity. So uh, obviously, what I've described to you today, these are very recent data. This constitutes a first step toward uh, rationalizing and predicting uh, solvent dependence of enzyme selectivity. Much more needs to be done, uh, in particular in terms of uh, broadening the range of enzymes and substrates that we use. There are some conceptual uh, issues with the Unifact and computer modeling that we're working on, but I think the first step has been made. We will see uh, um, how uh, the next steps uh, uh, will work out. But if this, uh, uh, um, uh, if this sort of direction of research continues as it has so far, what hopefully we will be able to do is to rationally control enzyme selectivity, selectivity of a given enzyme, simply by changing the solvent. And furthermore, we will be able to predict how a selectivity of a given enzyme toward a given substrate depends on the structure of the enzyme and on physical chemical properties of the solvent and uh, uh, the, uh, the substrate. And that, of course, should greatly expand 
the range of opportunities that exist in the use of enzymes as practical catalysts because it means that if you don't like, uh, say, um, uh, the enantiose selectivity of a given enzyme, screening is not the only option. Uh, uh, optimizing the, uh, the solvent is another one and certainly a much easier option. There are many organic solvents around, so a much easier option uh, to implement. Okay. And finally, let me acknowledge the people who have done the work that I've described to you today. Um, uh, I've been very fortunate to have uh, had some excellent co-workers over the years, and the work that I've described to you today has been done by uh, two, graduate, two excellent graduate students, Charles Westcott and Tao Ki, uh, and also by a, um, uh, a postdoc from Japan, uh, Dr. Uh, Horikoshi Noritomi. And thank you very much for your attention. slide you were singing the praises of running reactions with organic solvents. Right now there's a trend among uh, organic chemists to sing the praises of running reactions in water. The you grass is always greener somewhere, somewhere else. else. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, right. So uh, can you just tell me what your thoughts are on, on this idea that we should do, be running all our reactions in water, not in organic solvents? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, uh, we shouldn't be running all our reactions either in water or in organic solvents. I mean, I, I think that there, is, uh, uh, there are situations where it's appropriate to carry out reactions in water and situations where it's appropriate to carry out organic, uh, reactions in organic solvents. The organic chemists, of course, have, have always carried out reactions in organic solvents. Now they want to uh, they, they view water as the next challenge. Enzymologists have always carried out reactions in water. And uh, I think we've done what we could with enzymes in water. But I would like to see what the new opportunities will be in organic solvents. And certainly controlling selectivity is one such opportunity. It, it happens so often that uh, you, there's a terrific reaction that somebody really wants in uh, chemical industry or pharmaceutical industry. And you take enzymes and you just put them there. And they do it, but not quite well enough. And, and there is a sense of frustration that, gee, but only gave me another 20% uh, of an anti-meric excess or something like that. This gives us this opportunity. Uh, I had a question on your molecular modeling. Uh, essentially, when you, when you randomize the enzyme and the substrate molecules and you bring them together, you reduce the entropy of the system. How do you know that the substrate molecule always bangs on the active site of the enzyme? Yeah, that's a very good question. See, we always, we uh, semi-fix the substrate in the active center. What we do, we take that oxygen of the, of the uh, uh, tetrahedral intermediate, and we fix this oxygen in the, what's called the oxyanion hole of the active center of the enzyme. So there is a one-point attachment. It's not kind of free to go wherever it wants to go. It is fixed in the active center, and furthermore, in a certain point of the active center. But it can rotate and can do many other things, because we know that the transition state, the tetrahedral intermediate, is going to end up there with at least one point. But it's only a one-point attachment, so there is still a great deal of uh, rotation and, uh, uh, and, and other degrees of freedom there. seminar, I got the impression that you were uh, lamenting the fact that certain organic solvents that could have a small amount of water in them were not very good for this technique and you weren't very very successful at predicting the things that you wanted to predict. Yet as I looked at, at your data, it seemed pretty good to me over right. very hydrophobics and moderate right. hydrophobics. Well, what I, what I uh, lamented about in the, in, in the very beginning of the seminar was that if that if you compare the enzymatic activity, not the selectivity, but the enzymatic activity in hydrophobic solvents with that in hydrophilic solvents, the former is usually substantially higher because hydrophobic solvents don't strip the water from enzymes, hydrophilic solvents do. But then I said, fortunately, enzymes kind of take care of the water that they really want and hold on to that uh, essential water very tightly so that even in hydrophilic solvents, we still get respectable activity. Okay. Now, the date, most of the data I showed, they were selectivity, so there are ratios of constants, so you have no way of, of possibly determining from those data how the reactivities uh, actually compared in different solvents. And indeed, as a general rule, the more hydrophilic the solvent is, the lower the enzymatic activity, although we and others have now figured out ways of how to greatly enhance that activity, so that's not very much of a concern anymore. Can I also ask you about one, one more? Sure. Um, 
one particularly bizarre solvents tend to be fluorocarbons. Yeah. And, and I'm not sure why, whether it's the, the, the high polarizability of the bond or whatever. And I noticed that you hadn't really included fluorocarbons in any of your, your list there. Have you? Right. No, we have actually now used uh, fluorinated uh, uh, hydrocarbons, and you know, we found that they don't have any unusual um, uh, features in, in these types of studies. This is uh, one of those things that I sort of uh, mentioned briefly at some point. You know, we made a, a lot of assumptions uh, you know, here and a number of approximations because at several points we reached a situation where either you stop, throw your hands in the air and say, well, Jim, there's nothing I can possibly account for that. Or you explicitly state what assumption you're making. We assume that all the solvents have the same size. Is it a right assumption? Of course not. It's an approximation. And, you know, we would basically file them in and just say, well, let's just see uh, how it's going to turn out. And what that tells me is that it's not a significant factor, but it's clearly an approximation. And uh, of course you're right that they do have different uh, dimensions. Uh, we have to do it. So if this is the case, then you might be able to get at solvent mixtures. Yeah, because yeah, we, we do. The ball. We're absolutely, we do very well with solvent mixtures. Yeah, we actually, I, mean, I didn't include them there, but we have done we have worked in uh, uh, binary mixtures of various solvents and uh, uh, unifact uh, coefficients are actually additive, so it's not a big deal. And you know, we can readily work in, in mixtures and we can do predictions with the same degree of validity in mixtures as we do in, in pure solvents. So that's definitely true. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the, uh, how you start the enzyme form, like a media pH, where you got it from, you remember the memory. Right. Uh, what is that into the calculation, you know, the words, uh, in terms of predicting um, where it came from? It doesn't, because, see, uh, one of the uh, beauties about measuring selectivities is that all these other parameters, such as the pH memory and this and that, they will all cancel out, because presumably they will have the same effect uh, on both an antimer. So whatever they were, they will cancel out. So are you saying if I do a pH 4 yeah. versus pH 7 and right. enzyme? Well, we would always lyophilize, well, no, in this particular case, we would always crystallize uh, the enzyme, or at some point would expose the enzyme uh, to uh, the aqueous solution of the appropriate pH, okay? We would always do that, okay? Mm -hmm. But then we'd add organic solvent, and, uh, you know, even if there was some uh, deviation from that optimal state of ionization, well, it will affect the R and S and antimers to the same extent, so it will cancel out. Uh, so one other minor question here, the stability. Yeah. Uh, can I keep using the enzyme and the solvent for a, over and over a thousand, I mean, thousand days? Uh, uh, what I happens don't know about thousand days, but I can tell you that uh, we, some of the processes that we've developed actually have been commercialized. And, you know, there are folks now in industry who use uh, these, these enzymes, and many of them, uh, in fact, uh, do recycle them. So they just filter them out. They uh, wash them uh, with water, uh, rehydrate them, and then throw them back, and then wash them with an organic solvent again, and uh, put them back in organic solvent. I would add parenthetically that in one particular commercial application, uh, this is uh, in, in Europe, uh, MIT got, got a patent, and, and it was licensed to an Austrian chemical company called Chemil Linz. They're using uh, these enzymes and organic solvents to produce optically active phenoxyprobionic herbicides, okay? They actually found that the enzyme that they use is so cheap that there's no need for them to recycle, they should throw it away. It's not even an enzyme, it's a, it's a yeast uh, lipase, which you know, they just simply take the, uh, it's an extracellular enzyme, so they just take the, uh, uh, the fermentation broth and dehydrate it, so there's no need to do it. But in those cases where people wanted to do it, they can. Because actually, enzyme, in many cases, enzymes and organic solvents are more stable uh, than they are in water. Uh, when you freeze dry the enzyme, uh, do you still maintain a layer of uh, water absorbed to the enzyme? <coughs> it's, or not a, it's not a layer. Uh, it's a, a much smaller amount. For example, in the case of the crystal structure that I showed, so there's a blue pattern and the orange dots, and I'm sure that 
the, uh, the students uh, in, in the audience have a keen eye, probably I'm sure calculated, the best one probably calculated the number of water molecules. There are actually 99 water molecules bound to subtilicin, okay? Now, if you want to form a monolayer of water on the surface of subtilicin, simple calculation shows you need about 500, and this is 800, okay? So it's one-fifth of you know, the minimum you would need for a monolayer. So we're not talking about even a layer of water. We're talking about some patches of water, but water primarily bound to charged or very polar uh, groups on the surface. And that's the water that the enzyme really holds on to, and it's clear why, uh, because, of course, since they are bound to charged and polar residues, I mean, that's where the interactions are strong, so it, you know, they basically, uh, um, the enzyme doesn't let that water go. Is that also pH dependent, so if you change the pH and... Uh, it's, we haven't done that. Uh, those are tough experiments to do. Easy to talk about, but tough experiments to do. And, and one more side, sure. side question. Uh, you use uh, subtilizing cartridge in all your studies. Uh, why that and not uh, subtilizing DPM prime? Um, we initially selected it uh, as, a, as a model because the structure is known and everything was known. And it turned out to be actually a fairly good model. And of course, once you get started and other folks get started and the amount of information uh, begins to increase, it will be simply unwise to then start working with another enzyme unless you have a compelling reason for doing so because then you can't really compare it with what has been done so far. Here we're using both subtilizin and chymotrypsin because chymotrypsin, similar to subtilizin, both serum proteases, both have the catalytic triad in the active center, but chymotrypsin has a much more spacious binding site, so we can actually contrast this particular feature. But other than that, we kind of like to stay with, for mechanistic studies, we'd like to stay with just one or two enzymes and do it with them. Well, this is the previous question. Have you applied your model to lipases? Um, we uh, have not, um, uh, because although we now can, uh, because uh, over the last five, six years, uh, extra structures of five or six different lipases have been sold. However, they have been in aqueous solution. They have not been sold in water. See here, the reason why I'm working with subtilizin and also chymotrypsin because the structure has been determined in an organic solvent, so we know that the structure does not change. So you, in fact, can use the structure that was determined in the water. With lipases, if you ask me, well, do you think the structure will be similar? I would say, yeah, I think it will be similar to that in water. Do I know that? No, because it hasn't been solved. Solvent and structure takes uh, a year and a half of a good graduate student's life. So this is not something that we would just kind of do uh, unless there is a uh, good reason for it. And it's, it's kind of an iffy proposition. It doesn't work every time, even but for a good graduate. The reason I ask is that seven years ago, one of your students saw this. Yeah, he published former paper. students, yeah. yeah. He said that there is no correlation between the solvent and the serious activity. Well, what he, I'm sure what he meant by that is that he couldn't figure out what the correlation was. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, he, he's actually an excellent, uh, he was an excellent graduate student, and he, uh, uh, he's a very good scientist. But, you know, when we discovered this thing, you know, some 10 years ago, we also couldn't see what the correlation was. But then we thought hard, and, you know, we worked hard, and we started to uh, discern what the correlation is. I mean, that's how science develops. Did you do the experiment and verify the model with a varying temperature? Uh, whether we've done it even at different temperatures? Uh -huh. Yes, we have, yeah. Can you, so you can predict the selectivity? That's what we are trying to do right now. In fact, I have a visiting uh, scientist who uh, joined the lab in June, and she will be working on, uh, on that, whether uh, we want to be able to use Unifac, you know, just at, at different temperatures to predict uh, the temperature dependence of uh, open Done so what about the other part, the, the molecular modeling part, uh, when you do the temperature dependency? Molecular modeling, the way we do it, it's kind of temperature invariant. So, okay. I mean, there's nothing we can do there, yeah. okay? But, but the unifact parameters, well, that's, part yeah, that, that's right. So we can do, no, molecular modeling is, you know, it, there's nothing we can do there. I mean, we, you know, because we don't take temperature into account. We don't even take solvent into account. We, just, we, we you know, do everything in vacuum, right? Which is obviously not very mm -hmm. realistic model, but, but, you know, you do the best you can. Maybe. Uh, Two quick questions. So we have a plane to catch here. So. Okay. Um, uh, Subtilized and chemotrypsin are naturally um, enzymes found in, in aqueous systems. Absolutely. And yeah. I was wondering, you were talking talk about trends involving uh, hydrophilic versus hydrophobic solvents and activities. And have you, as um, membrane bound enzymes have been looked at, do they follow similar trends? Then you would expect they'd 
be more active in the organic solvents and less active in water. Yeah, uh, uh, there have been uh, a couple of studies, not by us, by others, uh, where people have would actually take membrane-bound enzymes, and they are active in organic solvents, just like these ones are. I have to say, Bob, though, that uh, you know, membrane-bound enzymes. I mean, when you sort of say membrane-bound enzyme, it would seem like you have an enzyme. And it's really embedded in the membrane. That's really not the case because they're only partially embedded, and the active center always faces the uh, the aqueous solution. So it's not they're not quite as membrane bound as uh, one would like them to be. But uh, very little work has been done with them. I think it'll be interesting to do. But what has been done is very much in line with these things. Yeah, yeah I noticed that uh, you used uh, cross-linked uh, right. cantrips and crystals. Where do you get them from? And part B, uh, what do you think of uh, CLEC? Right. Okay, well, let me just start with the second one because it's, you know, it's, it's easy. Uh, uh, you know, Maybe you ought to define that. Uh, huh? CLEC. Yeah, that's right. CLEC stands for cross-linked enzyme crystals, okay? And it's a brand a trade name, which I'm told that we're not supposed to use this name uh, because it was trademarked by, uh, um, uh, by Aldous uh, Corporation. I'm actually on the scientific advisory board, so I'm sure they wouldn't sue me, but, but uh, it, um, it certainly, I mean, I think that it's, it's a useful, way of presenting enzymes because they're robust catalysts and so forth. Now let me just go to the first question, which I think is an interesting question because it's something that people actually may have wondered. You know, when we decided that we really have to solve the structure of an enzyme in an organic solvent because uh, without that we can do a lot of hand waving, but how do you know what the structure really is? But here, of course, we hit the first snag because if you want to determine crystal structure of a protein, the first thing you absolutely must have for that is a protein crystal. If there is no protein crystal, there will be no structure, okay? Now, in order to obtain a protein crystal, you need to be able to dissolve it in the solvent and then crystallize it from there. But as I said earlier, enzymes and proteins in general are not soluble in most organic solvents. So we kind of hit a snag there because we obviously couldn't do it. So what we decided to do then is to <coughs> take uh, an enzyme, dissolve it in water, crystallize it from water, and then gradually uh, uh, get rid of the water and replace the interstitial water with a water miscible solvent. And we started doing it, and we started doing it with find that by the time you get to 40, 50, 60 percent organic solvent, crystal will crack, okay? And if you look on the microscope, it's kind of a spectacular explosion of the crystal. I mean, nobody got hurt, but it's really sort of <laughs> an, uh, an explosion. And we tried everything. We couldn't do it. Then what we decided to do is that the next best thing would be to lightly cross-link it, okay? And that also was kind of difficult, but we found the window of opportunity, so we lightly cross it. So the difference between our crystals and CLEX, the commercially available um, uh, catalysts, uh, and I'm not supposed to say that they're CLEX, is that they actually cross link it in a big way because they want to get a very robust catalyst. We prepare our own lightly cross linked crystals, so we crystallize enzymes ourselves, we lightly cross link them uh, in aqueous solution, then gradually replace, uh, displace the interstitial water with. Uh, uh, organic solvents. Um, and we found that cross-linking actually doesn't make any difference. Uh, it makes a difference only in terms of intermolecular interactions, not in terms of intramolecular interactions, okay? So the ca in other words, the, stru the catalytic activity is the same in organic solvents, whether you cross link it or not. It's only the integrity of the crystal, which of course enables you to do X-ray crystallography. Uh, just before we thank our speaker again, uh, Evie and Leonidas, just for a second, so we here. So let's thank Professor Kuvanoff again for the <laughs>